Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Amber Nightingale Sultani, the Associate State Director for Community Outreach with AARP here in Northern Virginia. And I wanna welcome you and thank you for joining us today. AARP Virginia is thrilled to continue our collaboration with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University. This collaboration allows us an opportunity to bring our members a sampling of the rich programs that is offered each semester by Ali Mason. From our earliest beginnings, AARP has been a champion of lifelong learning. Our founder, Dr. Ethel Percy Andrews, once said, the eagerness to learn, to pioneer in the development of new skills and new abilities, to broaden the personal scopes of understanding, to freshen the mind with new ideas and new concepts, to achieve new heights of knowledge has no age restriction. Those words are as true today as when she spoke them in the 1950s. Studies have shown that challenging your brain in new ways throughout your life may strengthen your brain. Our brain is stimulated and makes new connections when we learn new things or pursue new interests. So AARP encourages you to stay curious and give yourself a good mental workout by doing something that challenges your thinking, offers you enjoyment, and encourages you to grapple with new and complex ideas. And I hope today's lecture will do that for you and more. Thank you again for joining us. Greetings and warm welcome from Ollie Mason. The Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University has been in existence for over 30 years. We offer lectures, clubs, special events, and trips, as well as many volunteer opportunities such as teaching, and service on committees. There are many things you can learn and do at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. We're very happy to be collaborating today with AARP, and I wanna welcome all of our OLLI members, as well as those of you who are coming in from Virginia and across the United States. We're very happy that you've joined us today, and we hope that you will look at our website to learn more about OLLI at OLLI, O-L-L-I, Dot gmu dot edu. Please enjoy today's presentation. This class once again is Have You Checked Your Personality Lately? Our speaker is Douglas Stowell. And Douglas has been a national OLLI instructor from Furnham University in Greenville, South Carolina. He has a BS in mathematics and an MBA in marketing. His career focuses include market research, public opinion, and political polling. Douglas has held executive positions with three US and one UK major research firm and opened his own firm in 2008. Please go ahead. Good afternoon to all of you there, uh, part of the George Mason Ali organization and uh, Virginia's art program. Um, I spent 13 years in the D.C. area. I uh, lived in Ashburn, Virginia, so I'm very familiar with, uh, with you all there. Uh, for those of you who have been with me for other programs, you know I pack a lot of things into a short period of time. Uh, this one is a fun program. This is not my stock and trade. My stock and trade is normally uh, global issues and how the U.S. compares globally. Uh, some of you may have uh, been in that course, uh, that program uh, earlier this year. Uh, this one is strictly for fun. A uh, little background, my uh, daughter has a degree in psychology and a master's in counseling and raised the question about a year and a half ago about personality, uh, introducing me to something that was new for me, uh, some of the uh, more current and contemporary personality tests. Certainly Myers-Briggs was very familiar. Um, hopefully some of you or most of you have received a note that does have links to both Myers-Briggs and the Enanogram. Uh, my apologies that it did not get out as uh, sooner. Um, I work with about 40 different OLLAs and somehow I got my dates out of uh, order and it, you should have gotten it sooner. So I, I uh, realize that probably you haven't had a chance to explore those links just yet, but we'll certainly talk in more depth about Myers-Briggs and the Enanogram. But I just want to reinforce the fact that indeed we're doing this for fun. 
Uh, it was a welcome relief for me. I've enjoyed doing this. I've presented it about 30 times now. Um, we'll have a lot of fun this afternoon. Let's see if we can find something to look at besides my face. So as was announced, this is the Have You Checked Your Personality Lately course. Well, uh, as I suggested uh, about a year and a half ago, I realized that, gee, we check a lot of things in our lives, but hardly ever do we check back on where our personality is. Uh, so let's do a little looking. Won't ask you to read a whole lot. I will tell you there will be some exercises. So you might want to start locating uh, a tablet, a uh, pencil, a pen, uh, maybe a calculator. Perhaps your phone has a calculator uh, app. Take a quick read of this. Every dad at some point faces that age old question from their children, where did I come from? And here's a case where um, his son wanted to know where he came from. His dad tried to explain in the best he could four year old uh, words about the birds and the bees, but that really wasn't the question. Uh, his friend Davey comes from Chicago. He just wanted to know where he came from. And in life, isn't that always the way we need to understand who's asking the question and who's answering the question? Well, I'm coming to you from Greenville, South Carolina right now, up here in the foothills. Uh, we're about 20 miles from the North Carolina border. Let me put the nasty pointer option up here. There we go, nice red pointer. Here's Greenville, South Carolina. I'm part of Furman University, which is uh, not part of, but I'm part of the Furman University OLLI organization. Uh, I teach uh, courses, uh, long-term courses there, but my main focus is working with as many OLLIs as possible on uh, short programs like this one. Um, You know a bit about my background. It is market research and political polling. Uh, and I have worked for uh, global research firms, both here in the US and in Europe. So I have to uh, give you this disclaimer. Uh, most instructors don't start with a disclaimer, but I will. Uh, obviously, a disclaimer is a statement that denies something, especially responsibility. Uh, as you read and heard, I'm not a trained psychologist. I'm not a specialist in the field of personality. I do have one. Uh, I used to say, I know I do I play one on television, but I guess I am coming to you on a video screen. Um, we're doing this strictly for fun. We're gonna learn some things together about personality, uh, our own and uh, the world in general. Quick not to worry note. We're gonna cover a lot of material here in this one session. Um, I don't have a good editor, so I couldn't decide what to cut out, so I left it all in. But I will send you, uh, or I will send uh, the George Mason Ollie uh, representative a PDF copy of the entire session after we wrap up today. Uh, they will be able to provide a complete copy of the entire program, should you want to follow up and do any of the other exercises that we'll, break, we'll briefly talk about. So you don't really need to take notes other than to participate in some of the exercises that we're going to be doing. All right, let's have some fun with personality. Here's, here's uh, a couple of images. I change these from time to time. Remember the days of doing the team building exercises? If you worked for a company that decided to have a team building exercise, very popular in the 80s and 90s. Uh, most of us weren't that thrilled if we had to go to a team building exercise because often it involved doing a personality exercise. Uh, Haven't we all felt like the middle uh, image there? And, you know, on the surface, we're cool as a cucumber, but on the inside, we're like the squirrel in traffic that changes its mind quickly. Often we think about geese, they look serene on the water, uh, but paddling like mad underneath. And that third image just saw a squirrel carrying a wine bottle up a tree, 
Aha, maybe I found my spirit animal. Quickly look at these two on selflessness and narcissism. And I know you women uh, there in the audience will identify with Coco Chanel's comment. Long as you know men are like children, you know everything. A lot of words on this chart, but again, I remind you that you can get a complete copy. This one I just found here recently, the way you laugh reveals your personality. Did you know that? I, I hadn't thought about that. The way you laugh reveals your personality. Uh, if you giggle, you're an optimist with a vibrant, youthful outlook on life. If you uh, laugh with a guffaw, uh, this hearty, deep-seated belly laugh reveals you're uninhibited, willing to take chances and seize opportunities. If you kind of cackle, that's a loud laugh that uh, carries often heard above the roar of the crowd. Uh, it's a piercing laugh and it reveals that you'd like to let yourself go. If it's a snicker, it involves you laughing under your breath, an indication you often see the funny side of a situation, even when others do not. Uh, snort. Uh, we've all seen folks that do that. I've done it from occasion to occasion. A snort results when you try to bottle up your laughter and it ends up in your nose. A tendency to restrain laughter indicates you're shy and don't like to call attention to yourself. In ordinary laughter, and I'm not sure what they mean by ordinary laughter, a uh, type of laughter, well modulated, appropriate, never too loud, shows you like to be one of the crowd. Um, if you want to hear the whole scientific explanation about laughter and what it reveals about your personality, uh, there'll be a link here to the site where you can go and read the whole article. Uh, something I hadn't thought about. Uh, the way we laugh reveals our personality. This has nothing to do with personality, but it's a piece of information I picked up just recently. Um, it was a PBS uh, uh, documentary about uh, Ben Franklin. Uh, this may be a piece of information you're not familiar with either. Uh, this is a woodcut illustration from one of Franklin's early ventures, the Pennsylvania Gazette. It's the first instance of the American colonies being depicted as a snake. Interestingly enough, it was 20 years later here in South Carolina that a South Carolina politician created this flag that we all may be more familiar with, the don't tread on me with the coiled rattlesnake. Well, why the rattlesnake? Franklin chose the rattlesnake as a symbol because one, it was native to North America and we were protesting uh, back to the uh, uh, British uh, kingdom. And it has 13 rattles just like 13 colonies. A uh, little piece of information uh, you can stick in your memory bank and it'll probably pop out at the most inopportune time. Let's think about what a front door mat might say about our personality. Well, we all have seen mats that look like this. Pretty traditional welcome mat, nothing too threatening, nothing too comical about it. Uh, but there are hundreds of other doormats that one can order. Uh, my British friends, uh, I've seen one in, in one of their uh, residences. The neighbors have better stuff. Don't steal from me. The neighbors have better stuff. Uh, unless you have tacos, tequila, Girl Scout cookies, or my Amazon package, go away. Uh, ding bell, a doorbell broken, yell ding dong really loud. Uh, we've all come to houses where there's dogs that announce your arrival. No need to knock. We know you're here. Uh, we're probably just pretending not to be home. And here in the South, this is a traditional greeting in the South. Well, butter my butt and call me a biscuit. Look who's here. How about bumper stickers? What can we learn about someone's personality from their bumper sticker? These are actual bumper stickers. Driver carries no cash. He's married. Using your turn signal is not giving information to the enemy. Uh, we've all seen one of these drivers. The closer you get, the slower I drive. Uh, here's one for your women again. Women are natural leaders. You're following one now. 
Uh, I'm sure we've all seen these stick figures, usually with uh, two or three or four kids and a dog. Uh, this is uh, just a couple with a lot of money bags, uh, kind of making the point, no, 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 we don't have a lot of children, but we have a lot more money. Uh, this one must be a mathematician. Alcohol and calculus don't mix, don't drink and derive. And then there's this one. Oh, heavens. We've all probably seen one of these back of the car covered with bumper stickers. I wonder what kind of person is driving that car. And finally, this is one I happened to see uh, just up the road a piece in Asheville at uh, the Biltmore Museum. Fairly new car with a very attractive bumper sticker saying, don't panic. What, per what uh, persuaded the owner of this car to put that uh, bumper sticker there? Uh, one can speculate. There's more to personality than bumper stickers, right? Well, let's uh, dig in a little deeper. Since I'm not a, not a professional in the field of psychology and personality, I had to really do some homework and some research here to find out how contemporary psychologists define personality. Um, it's essentially how we think, how we feel, and how we behave. How we think, how we feel, and we be, how we behave. Contemporary psychologists feel that our personality is a relatively stable combination of these characteristics. Uh, when I first read that, uh, I challenged the thought because I certainly feel I've changed over the many years I've been on the planet. Uh, but come to find out, at least from a test point of view, uh, I haven't really changed much at all. You want to do a few personality warm-ups. Uh, we've had our lunch, we've had our afternoon tea or coffee or uh, espresso. Uh, hopefully we can uh, dive in and do a couple of exercises. Take a quick 10 second look at this. Those of you who are on a small uh, device to your phone, I realize that's a little smaller. If you see a man or a woman First, is said to reflect your dominant personality traits. Left side of the brain is linked to being more analytical, verbal, and orderly, and better at tasks such as reading and writing. The right is considered to be the more creative side and linked to being more visual and intuitive. The way you interpret an image can be seen in more than one way. Uh, it can reveal which side of your brain is more dominant. There are two interprets interpretations. You either see an old man or a young woman or girl can speak to your inner sight and mental age too. I'll let you read this. What does it mean if you saw the old man? What does it mean if you saw the woman? It's kind of a first, a first quick snapshot about your personality. I'll give you a minute or so to uh, kind of digest this. We're not, we're not going to talk about this in any great depth, but it's just kind of a warm up exercise. Again, and, and copies will be available, PDF copies will be available following uh, our uh, program today. I saw the image of the man first. My wife saw the woman first. We do have a question. What if you saw both at the same time? Uh, you'd have to define, do you see a man or do you see a woman? Again, there'll be a link and you can go and explore more fully what this is. Uh, I prefer not to take questions until I uh, okay. uh, announce the end of a, an exercise. We have a lot of people today and we have a number of things we want to get through, uh, but there will be a link uh, in answer to your question where you can go and explore more fully 
uh, what this exercise means. This is gonna be our first exercise. So try to locate that pad of paper and uh, a pencil. Uh, again, I tried to focus on what contemporary personality psychologists believe. Um, they really believe that there are five basic dimensions of personality. You'll often hear them talk about them as the big five personality traits. Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And I want to make sure we have a good understanding of uh, what is meant by all of those. You, you may have noticed or didn't that if you rearrange those, they spell the word canoe, conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, openness, and extroversion. Uh, here's the link where uh, I obtained this exercise. And now I happen to pick the photo of the canoe tipping over, hopefully we're not going to tip over in our canoe. You're going to be asked to rate yourself in terms of how others see you on a scale of one to nine in each of those characteristics. But let's make sure we understand the characteristics. Conscientiousness, a one on the conscientious scale. You don't like structure and schedules. You make messes, you don't take care of things, you fail to return things and put them back where they belong, procrastinate important tasks, and you fail to complete necessary or assign tasks. On the high end of the scale, the nine, you do spend time preparing, you do finish important tasks right away, you pay attention to detail, and you like having a set schedule. Agreeableness. Someone low in agreeableness really doesn't take much interest in other people. They don't really care about how other people feel. They have little interest in other people's problems. They insult and belittle others. And they manipulate others to get what they want. Someone high in agreeableness, the nine end of the scale, has a great deal of interest in other people, cares about others, feels and demonstrates empathy and concern for others enjoys helping and contributing to the happiness of other people and assists others who are in need of help. Neuroticism, and I want you to pay special attention here. Someone low in neuroticism, a one, would be an emotionally stable person, someone who deals well with stress, rarely feels sad or depressed, doesn't worry much and is very relaxed. Someone high in neuroticism, the nine end of the scale, experiences a lot of stress, worries about many different things, gets upset easily, experiences dramatic shifts in mood, feels anxious and struggles to bounce back after stressful events. That's neuroticism. Openness, someone low in openness, really doesn't like change, doesn't enjoy new things, kind of resists new ideas, not particularly imaginative, definitely doesn't like abstract or theoretical concepts. Whereas someone high in openness is very creative, open to trying new things, focused on tackling new challenges, and happy to think about abstract concepts. Finally, extroversion, probably uh, no surprises here. Someone who is low in extroversion would be someone who is uh, introverted. They prefer solitude. They're exhausted when having to socialize a lot. Find it difficult to start conversations. They don't like making small talk. Carefully think things through before speaking and don't like being the center of attention. High, of course, a highly extroverted person really likes to be the center of attention, starts conversations, loves meeting new people, has a wide social circle of friends, finds it easy to make friends, feels energized when around other people, sometimes says things without thinking. All right. I want you to take that pad of paper and simply list C-A-N-O-E across the top. And again, what I'm asking you to do now is to think in terms of how you believe your friends and relatives perceive you on that one to nine scale 
for each of those characteristics. I'm going to put the definitions back up and just write the scale number under each characteristic. Uh, I'll give you about five minutes. Uh, and I found it really doesn't take five minutes. As with all of these exercises, go with your gut instinct. Uh, normally, your first reaction is probably the right one. Uh, we tend to overthink some of these exercises. Uh, when we, if we just go with kind of our gut instinct, we're probably going to be correct. So here they are. Here are the definitions of each. Uh, I'll give you uh, a two minute warning uh, after three minutes. And then we'll uh, entertain a few chats about it. We have over 200 people today, so we can't spend a terrible amount of time uh, chatting, unfortunately. And just a heads up, if you care to, to put in a chat, the question I'll be asking is, uh, how hard or easy did you find this exercise to do while thinking in terms of how others perceive you? Doug, while you're waiting on this, I've had several requests for your email. Is it okay with you if I put your email in the chat? Sure. Thank you. That's three minutes, uh, another uh, minute or two. And again, if you do want to enter a chat, Matt, we'll try to uh, address uh, three or four of them. Um, how hard or easy did you find this exercise uh, when it uh, asks you to think in terms of how others perceive you? Okay, um, I see there are a significant number of chats. There are, as I said, over 200 people here today. This course is actually designed for a smaller group uh, where we uh, uh, can have a little more personal interaction, but um, I'll certainly uh, take uh, three or four chats here if you have them. Okay, most of them think it was easy to think about how others perceive me, tough to score my own. Um, most of them seem to think it was pretty easy, but it took a little more thought. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm seeing. 
that's that's kind of the the uh, theme there. Yes. What I will tell you from uh, the, the many uh, uh, sessions that I have presented and people that have uh, followed up and followed back with me is that uh, if you have a notion, you can ask others to do the same exercise, but how do they perceive you? And if they're really good friends, I would suggest that might work well. But uh, sometimes there's a difference between how we think others perceive us and in fact, how others in, in fact do perceive us. And this is one little exercise, it's quick and easy uh, that allows you to do that. Um, we're gonna do several more here that dig in a little deeper. So look, uh, I wanna press ahead. I don't wanna leave anything uh, out today, uh, particularly uh, for as many of you who have signed up for this course. I wanna make sure we cover everything uh, we can and we can follow up personally uh, afterwards. We're gonna try another one. <laughs> this is a very different exercise. I, I uh, quite assure you, you've never done one quite like this. Uh, this is called the Sherwin-Williams Color Personality Test. We're gonna find out if you're one of eight personalities according to Sherwin-Williams, the paint company. Are you a free spirit? Are you a trendsetter? Are you a naturalist? Are you a minimalist? Are you creative? Are you a nurturer? Are you enthusiast? Or are you a dreamer? Here's the link back if you ever wanna go back and look at more detail about how Sherwin-Williams put this together. This was a marketing program that they ran for about six years um, I saw it probably five years ago when we relocated here and we were uh, redecorating a new home that we had just bought. Uh, I don't think they're still using this marketing program. That's where I saw it. I did follow up and I did talk to the vice president of marketing with Sherwin Williams about how they created it. And we'll discuss that uh, after you've had a chance to do it. So the issue is, can your personality be predicted from the colors you choose? Well, there are eight color sets that I'm gonna ask you to look at. You should consider the set, the range of colors in a particular interior decor, the range of colors, not necessarily one color, but the range of colors in a particular interior decor. And you look at eight different sets. Uh, you should consider them a group of colors, don't focus on one. And you're to select the set or the grouping that's most pleasing to you. Most pleasing to you. Now, many people have in this exercise come back and say, well, I didn't really like any of them. Well, then I guess your task is to pick the, the set that is less displeasing. But the idea is look at all eight sets, pick one that is most pleasing, and then we'll see what it says about your personality. All right, make sense? No paper and pencil, I think you can remember the number. Here are the eight sets. Now, again, if you're watching on a phone, I know this is kind of, this is a small detail on a phone, but hopefully on a tablet or on a PC, uh, you will be able to discern uh, the differences. Again, look at, the, look at the grouping, the set, not necessarily one color. And I'll give you a couple of minutes. Uh, again, don't overthink or overdwell on it. And if you do care to put a chat in, uh, once you see how, with the result, I really don't have anything further to add to this uh, other than a little more explanation about how Sherwin Williams put it together. But again, pick the set most pleasing or least displeasing. Everybody got a number in mind? So, can't wait to find out. Are you a free spirit, a trendsetter? What are you? Here they are. Here's the definition of each of those by Sherwin Williams. 
I came out a minimalist. Uh, initially, I was uh, a little offended by that, quite honestly. But then the more I thought about it, yeah, from, from a, uh, you know, I, I like things fairly uh, understated, fairly, fairly minimal. Um, I don't like uh, personalities that are bold and outspoken. Um, yeah, I can understand that. Sherwin Williams does not define these eight categories. The definition is left up to the student. So if you uh, pick number one, uh, it's your definition of what is a free spirit or what is a trendsetter or a naturalist and so forth. Um, if you have a thought about it and, and care to make a comment, just for the general good, we'll be happy to report it for the, uh, for the entire group. I will say that Sherwin Williams, when I did discuss with the vice president of marketing, who is a woman, by the way, uh, what sort of scientific uh, effort was put into this? Uh, basically, Sherwin Williams has over the years uh, collected a fairly large database uh, of color preferences by region in the United States and, and Canada, uh, but largely the United States. Um, broadly by sex and broadly by age, separating commercial printers away from it, but, but homeowners by and large. So they have some basic uh, information by region, by sex and broad age groups. Um, frankly, they did not engage any sort of uh, professional psychologist in this. The, uh, uh, a team of uh, really first year interns working for them uh, put this together about eight or nine years ago. Um, so there's no real scientific background to it. You will notice that by and large, I don't think anybody is offended if they're a free spirit or a trendsetter or a naturalist or they're creative or a nurturer or enthusiast or a dreamer. Uh, the minimalist, yes, I, I finally reconcile that uh, to my own nature. Um, any quick comments there that uh, have come in? You have a couple. Um, one of them is, do these assessments change throughout time? And many people found that they had trouble picking between two and then they agreed with both of the categories underneath of those for their personality. That's interesting. That's interesting. I, I've had people respond, uh, uh, like, for example, nurses will frequently respond that they pick number six, nurturer. Well, certainly a nurse is indeed that, or a teacher, for example. One thing I will point out is that contemporary, if you, if you go into a model of a new home these days, what color will you see? You're going to see grays. Grays have taken over from the beiges. So in all in each case is here, you're going to see some grays here and there. Um, but again, this went back about nine years uh, with Sherwin Williams. Well, I hope you weren't offended uh, by the category that you picked. Um, but that's Sherwin Williams. Uh, let's see if we can get a little more uh, evidence-based assessments of personality. Um, like I said, I don't think any of us would be particularly offended if we were picking uh, a set that uh, was in any of those eight categories. But then again, it was a marketing program and obviously Sherman Williams would uh, not want to offend anyone uh, in their marketing. So are we ready to try another one? A little deeper maybe? This one will take a little time and a little thought. It's called the five minute personality test. You're gonna need that paper and you're going to need a calculator. Um, do you see yourself as critical and quarrelsome, reserved and quiet? This is called the 10 item personality inventory or the five minute personality quiz. I want you to get the sheet paper out. I want you to number down the side from one to 10, probably two lines apart. And Across the top, put L-O-G-B, 
And for those of you who may have already seen this exercise, uh, don't spill the beans. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly uh, be identifying what those mean in a, a little bit here. So across the top, four columns, L-O-G-B, one to 10 down the side. And again, here's the link to the source for that exercise. Here's what I'd like you to do. And I'll, I'll walk you through uh, a bit of an explanation here. Looks a little uh, intimidating, but I think once you see uh, one example, it will be fairly uh, straightforward. What you're asked to do is to place a four in the column with the word and phrase most like you, as you perceive yourself. The word or phrase most like you. Then you stay on the same line and put a three in the column next most like you, as you see it. And similarly, a two and a one. Well, let's do one line here. Um, I'll, I'll use mine as an example. Line one has four phrases, likes authority, enthusiastic, and sensitive feelings, likes instructions. Oh my, those are very different uh, words or phrases. Uh, well, I'm certainly enthusiastic. I, I absolutely, that, that, that's, if anything, I'd like to think I'm enthusiastic. So I'm gonna put a four there. Now, likes authority or likes instructions. Hmm. I, I, I've never been accused of having terribly sensitive feelings. So that's not in the running right now. We did, I did have to clarify just one phrase uh, with the creators of this exercise. This means likes to be in authority, likes to be in authority. So I put a three there and I put a two likes instructions and a one for sensitive feelings. So I had a four here, a three, a two and a one. Similarly, then you go through all 10 lines. Make sense? It takes, I think, a little more than five minutes, but I'll give you a one minute warning when four minutes are up. Uh, you can, if you have any questions, certainly put it in a chat and uh, she can quickly read it to me. But the clock starts now. And once you have numbers, uh, 40 numbers there, then add up the totals in each column. Uh, you'll, if you get two different answers, you'll have to add it up three times. Again, I'll announce when four minutes is up. As you're seeing, some of the words and phrases on each line are very, very different. So it really calls for some thought about how to score four, three, two, and one.
And again, you're thinking in terms of how do you see yourself? That's about uh, four minutes. We'll uh, we'll go another one minute. And again, copies of all of this will be available to you, so you can always go back and and check later if you don't get it all done. Another uh, another forty five seconds. That's about five minutes. So let, let's uh, let's see what uh, this is going to tell us. So are you an L, O, G, or a B? Well, are you a lion, an otter, a golden retriever, or a beaver? Column with the highest score is considered your dominant personality type. So if you were able to get through the entire exercise, and you have a total at this point for each uh, column. The one with the highest score is your dominant personality type. Second one with the second highest number is your subdominant type. Or you may have equal scores on a couple of, uh, of the columns. So your combination. Uh, it, this, this test recognizes that we are a combination of all for personality types. Two types of the highest score re reveal the most accurate picture of your natural inclination, strengths, and weaknesses. So what I'm going to go through now is I'm going to take you through the definitions of lion, otter, golden retriever, and beaver. And from a chat point of view, um, just be interested just in your reaction to whether or not you feel uh, that the lion, otter, or golden retriever uh, and beaver uh, definitions uh, for the particular column that you scored the highest in um, accurately reflect you. So that's something to think about as we go through the definitions. Again, this material is all available to you uh, on a PDF file that we can send out at the conclusion of the program. Uh, I'm not going to try to read everything here. Uh, the natural strengths of lions. Decisive, goal-oriented, achievement-driven, get results, independent, they're risk-takers, 
take charge, take initiative. They're very much a self-starter, persistent, efficient, competitive. They like challenges, variety, and change, and they're driven to complete projects quickly and effectively. But every personality has its weaknesses. In the case of the lion, they can be impatient, blunt, can be a poor listener, impulsive, demanding, uh, often view projects more important than people. They can be insensitive to the feelings of others. They may run over others who are slower to act or speak. They fear inactivity and relaxation and they're bored by routine or mechanics. Basic disposition, lions are fast paced and task oriented. They're motivated by results that include challenge, action, power, and credit for achievement. So that's the lion. So if you scored highest uh, under the L column, uh, you would be considered a lion. Otter, and their natural strengths, uh, uh, they are enthusiastic, they're optimistic, they're a good communicator, emotional and passionate, motivational and inspirational, outgoing, personal, dramatic and fun loving. But they have their weaknesses. Uh, they can be unrealistic. They're not detail oriented, uh, tend to be disorganized, can be impulsive. Uh, they listen to feelings above logic, can be reactive, they can be very talkative, and they're excitable. The basic disposition of the otter, fast paced, people oriented, they're motivated by recognition and the approval of others. Uh, the golden retriever. Natural strengths of a golden retriever, patient, easygoing, team player, stable, empathetic, compassionate, sensitive to the feelings of others, tremendously loyal. They put people above projects. They're dependable, reliable, supportive, and agreeable. But they too have weaknesses. They can be indecisive. They can be over accommodating. They may sacrifice results for the sake of harmony slow to initiate, really avoid confrontation even when it's needed. And they tend to hold grudges, remember hurts inflicted by others, and they fear change. Basic disposition, slow paced, people oriented, motivated by the desire for good relationships and the appreciation of others. Finally, the beaver, the beaver. We all know somebody who's like this. They're accurate, they're analytical, they're detail-oriented, they're thorough, they're industrious, they're orderly, they're methodical and exhaustive, they have high standards, very intuitive and very controlled. They too have weaknesses. They can be very hard on themselves, critical of others, a perfectionist, they're overly cautious. They won't make decisions without all the facts. They can be very picky and they can be overly sensitive. Basic disposition, slow pace, task oriented, motivated by the desire to be right and maintain quality. So there you have it, beavers, golden retrievers, otters, and lions. For a chat, how well do you think if a column stood out for you. In other words, you had a fairly high number in one column. Does it accurately describe you? I came out a lion, for example, and yeah, that's pretty accurate for me, both the strengths and the weaknesses. We're getting both yeses and noes. <laughs> the basic reaction, you know, it, typically this program is more uh, uh, video, uh, not video, but audio oriented, where we actually spend time discussing these things. But with 200 folks, it's difficult to do that and get through the entire program. Uh, but typically, the reactions have been, by and large, that it's fairly accurate uh, for those who actually scored uh, significantly in one column. Uh, they basically, uh, everyone said, yes, absolutely, that's me. 
for those, uh, I've had cases where people have said they have the same score in all four columns. Um, you do have I, a lot more yeses than nos. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Now that it's uh, it's scrolling, <laughs> so. The, the, that, te that tends to be the reaction that I've seen. Um, there are cases, however, where the, uh, the first, uh, the highest column, the second highest column are very close together. So that means there's kind of a mix there that goes on. At least that would be the interpretation that would be made uh, by the organization that produced this. Um, kind of a fun exercise. I, I, I found this one to be uh, quite revealing because it focuses not just on the natural strengths of the personality, but the weaknesses that go with it. Uh, something that we uh, can learn more from our weaknesses probably at this stage of life than, than from our strengths. All right, you've done well so far. Let's dig into some more here. This is a picture I took earlier this spring. I just happened to catch some cattle near me uh, with a magnolia kind of saying, what's up? Uh, we did a little look at color here. Uh, you know there are dozens and dozens and dozens of color tests that you can take. Here's a quick one. Uh, it's from a magazine called Neuropsych. Uh, my daughter indicated that it is one that the, uh, one of the more popular trade journals for psychologists. This is uh, from uh, May of 2020. Uh, what does your favorite color say about your personality? If you want to dig deeper into that article, uh, you can look that up online. The exercise is quite simple. Pick your favorite color here. I'll give you 30 seconds. And don't worry about shading. You know, just pick from the solid colors that you see here. Everybody has a favorite color and can probably quickly grab uh, uh, a notion here. Let me tell you what neuropsych says those colors mean. And again, I won't read everything here. It would be available to you. But if you pick red, you're seen as bold, a thrill seeker, adventure lover, can be a little impulsive, can be perceived as intimidating. If you pick the orange, you're seen as having fun and playful energy that people admire. You're social, maybe an extrovert. You nurture things. You enjoy deep conversations, cheerful. You love to play the host at parties. Uh, if you pick yellow, uh, it's a positive spirit, optimistic, you're cheerful, adventurous, you're calming for those around you. Uh, you have an infectious smile and a happiness that spreads to each person you encounter. Blue, blue is seen as someone who is dependable, trustworthy, uh, gentle, compassionate, peaceful, loyal, strong. Green, someone who's practical, down to earth, loves to give advice, loves to help others, enjoys the outdoors and finds balance in life important. Purple, quick-witted, you crave your own identity, you love unique things and want to stand out from the pack. You dance to the music no one else can hear and you thrive on creativity and inspiration. And the last three, pink, you're seen as fun, playful, uh, maybe a little naive. You wear a hat on your sleeve, you aren't afraid to express your emotions. Love and family are important. White, you're seen as calm, peaceful, innocent. Again, maybe a little naive. You like things clean and orderly. You like the thought of a fresh start or a blank canvas. And finally, black. Black, you're bold, a risk taker, a little impulsive, serious, maybe a little too serious. You're strong, command a sense of respect from your peers. Trustworthy, yeah, you can be a little intimidating. Here they are again. If you want to uh, indicate what color you picked and a yes or no as to whether you identify with those characteristics. I will tell you that blue has always been my favorite color. I'd like to think I'm dependable, 
I'd like to think I'm trustworthy. Yeah, gentle, I'm not sure people would say I'm gentle. And probably they wouldn't say I'm compassionate. Uh, peaceful, I'm peace loving. I don't know if that's the same as peaceful. Certainly think I'm loyal and strong. So yeah, maybe four out of six here I would identify with, but not all of them. So what color did you pick? And do you agree with the majority of the adjectives defining it? You're getting a lot of yeses. Um, you're getting some people who, you know, my favorite color is pink, but that's not who I am in that, by that <laughs> description. Uh huh. Uh, same with some some of the purples, but some purples agree. Okay. And blue sounds like a dog to someone. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come out the golden retriever, but you're, you're right. The golden retriever might be uh, the blue color. Mm -hmm. Basically, the the reaction I've had, and I'm I'm guessing probably about 600 or so people have taken this exercise in various programs I've presented. Um, 200 today is a world record, I can tell you. Um, by and large, people have said that they identify with maybe half or two thirds of the characteristics in the color they pick, but not all of them. Um, it's just another one of the hundreds and hundreds of personality exercises that are out there. Um, again, it'll be part of the PDF that I'll uh, make sure you have access to. One last color exercise. One organization considered these to be the top 10 colors in the world by preference. Pink, number 10, white, nine, gold, yellow, orange, black, purple, four, green, three, red, two. What's missing? Well, obviously blue. Uh, blue is by this organization considered the most popular color in the world. It's by an organization called the Top Tens. I'm familiar with them because they collect information on a whole range of categories, not always projectable to any total population. And now when I explore it a little further, yeah, this is uh, the people that have just responded to their surveys, not necessarily a, a projectable random sampling of uh, the universe. So. This one view, uh, blue came out as the uh, most popular color. All right, I'm gonna talk about Myers-Briggs. Now I know most of you have not had an opportunity to retake or take for the first time Myers-Briggs. Um, my apologies again, I didn't get that note out to you uh, for them to send to you until yesterday. Uh, so I'm sure you haven't had a chance to do it recently. Some of you, hopefully, I would guess about maybe half of you have taken Myers-Briggs in the past, many of us in the distant past, but you'll know that it's made up of categories like this. I'm going to go through and, and explain in a little more detail, uh, because I do want you to take a Myers-Briggs test at some point. Some of the history here. Catherine Briggs and her daughter, Isabel Briggs Myers are the creators of the Myers Briggs uh, personality test. I always thought it was her husband, Myers. Um, but when I look behind it, no, it's her daughter who married a Myers. And the way Isabel, uh, Catherine, her mother, began to think about personality is that when she met her future son in law, Myers, she observed the marked differences between his personality and that of others of his family. And that's what really began her thinking about uh, personality. Born in uh, 1875, lived a good long life, passed away in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania in 1968. Uh, her daughter joined her while she was still in college. Uh, the much of their work was done during World War II. Uh, and it was really tested among women first. As women were going into the industrial workforce in World War II, uh, it was used to help sort out wartime jobs that would be most comfortable and effective for women. 
So women were very much uh, at the focus of the development of the Myers-Briggs personality test. Uh, their first in handbook was published in 1944. It was converted to the Myers-Briggs type indicator in 1956, a manual published in 1962. It was purchased by Culting Psychologist Press in 1975. Uh, it was updated in 85, and a third edition came out in 98. And today there are, I've lost count, but there have to be at least 100 different uh, organizations that are licensed to provide some form of a Myers-Briggs test. It's basically a very uh, introspective self-report questionnaire. It attempts to assign four categories, introversion or extroversion, that's the E and the I, actually extroversion, introversion, sensing or intuition, that's the S and the N, thinking or feeling, that's the T and the F, and judging or perceiving, the J and the P. So we're gonna look at those in a little more uh, detail here. Now, Contemporary psychologists, that is here in the 21st century, argue that Myers-Briggs has poor validity. It doesn't measure what it purports to measure and it doesn't have predictive power. They say it has poor reliability, that you get different results for the same person on different occasions, that it measures categories that are not independent. You remember we talked about neuroticism earlier in the afternoon? It's incomprehensive due to missing neuroticism. These are the criticisms that contemporary psychologists have of Myers-Briggs. And yet, it remains the world's largest personality test. Even yet today, it's being conducted throughout the world. So it, it hasn't lost any uh, momentum in terms of its use. Now, there are many others that are utilized. Um, it won't be the first test that most contemporary psychologists under the age of 50 will introduce you to, um, certainly. Uh, having said all that, hopefully you will have received this. Uh, this gives you links to the personality test. Personality test I'm using is from an organization in the UK. Uh, the reason I pick it uh, it's called 16 Personalities, uh, and here is their link here. Uh, you can, you, the free test is, is uh, obviously at no charge, but to go for a fully in-depth analysis by Myers-Briggs, uh, this organization charges, I think, around $40, um, and it's a 40-page assessment. It, it's pretty, pretty detailed, pretty detailed indeed. Uh, the reason I pick it is that uh, it has the greatest detailed reporting available at a nominal fee. And it also has the largest database of people who have taken the test. And I'll show you why that comes to fruition in a moment. Here's the way they interpret that organization I just talked about. Here's how they interpret each of the 16 categories that uh, one can fall in. And what they've done is they've applied a one word description for each one. An INTJ uh, would be like an architect. They're imaginative, they're strategic, and they're planners. An INTP would be like a logician, innovative, curious, and logical. An ENTJ would be seen as a commander, bold, imaginative, strong-willed. An ENTP, a debater, smart, curious, intellectual. An INFJ, an advocate, quiet, mystical, and idealist. You can go through all of these. If you happen to have ever taken a Myers-Briggs test, uh, this is how this organization, 16 Personalities, uh, sees them in a very simple, short, three-word, uh, three-adjective definition. Now, I have come out an ENTJ six straight times over almost 60 years. I've never changed. I, I took it about a year ago when I was putting this program together. 
it had been maybe 15 years before I'd taken it. Um, I have not seen any change. The exercise has changed. I'm sure I've taken different exercises that are part of the Myers-Briggs, uh, but my outcome hasn't changed. I'm still an ENTJ, um, good, bad, or indifferent. And I did, I did take the more uh, detailed uh, exam and bought the uh, package. And it does get into detail about some of the uh, uh, weaknesses of the personality or some of the areas for improvement. I found it extremely useful. Um, I also found it extremely surprising that I hadn't changed. Um, people who have uh, participated in this program and have taken it recently uh, as a part of the program have reported back uh, not infrequently that they have changed. They've become more feeling or they've become more sensing or they've become more intuitive. Um, so we, it is possible that your personality does change over time. There's no question about it. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, again, uh, sake of time here, um, if someone would like to enter in chats uh, who has taken it recently and has someone to compare it to, has your personality changed by a Myers-Briggs exercise? So as indicated by a Myers-Briggs exercise. So I, I would uh, ask you to comment in that regard, just briefly. On the chat function, if you will. Again, I'm, I'm one of the examples of one of the just hasn't changed. I'm still the same. You're actually getting about a 50-50 split of yes, it has, and no, it hasn't changed. <laughs> and some of them are just, nope, always have been, always will be. Yeah, well, that's me. That's me. I don't have any kind of uh, accurate accounting for the numbers of people that have taken this program. Uh, but, you know, some have changed, some have not. And so that, that's uh, basically the reaction. Um, but this does remain, as I said, the world's largest uh, personality profile test. Uh, and certainly it goes back, as you saw, back to the mid 40s. Um, so it's been around a long, long time. Here's some of the detail you can get. Here's an ENTJ. Uh, this is some of the detail you get if you pay a little extra money. It actually breaks down uh, how extroverted, how introverted, is an ENTJ, uh, the thinking and feeling breakdown in terms of our nature, energy, how much is it spent intuitive versus observant, uh, on tactics, uh, approach to work planning and decision making, judging versus prospecting, uh, survey versus turbulent. You'll see an ANT in some reports, and that, that uh, actually points out assertive versus turbulent. Um, so you can get a lot more detail. Uh, you can get information like this. Again, this is from 16 personalities. Um, and again, it's their, their pool of, uh, it's in the millions uh, worldwide. And they have it broken down by country and by sex and by, uh, I thought they had it by broad age. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but certainly by sex and by country. Of the total that they have, 1.8% uh, of the population were ENTJs, a little more men than women. And here again, are adjectives associated with an ENTJ. You can get that same sort of detail and even further um, from uh, 16 personalities. Someone had more time on their hands and maybe during the pandemic, they had more time. Uh, <laughs> this is tongue in cheek. Uh, what they've tried to do is express what type of home each of these 16 personalities might prefer. Uh, an ENFP, a tiny home. An INFP, an English cottage. An ENTP, a contemporary style. Uh, in my case, an ENTJ, a city apartment. Eh, I don't know about that. Uh, I've never lived in a city apartment. Wouldn't be my first choice of housing. Uh, so however they put that together, I have no idea. Uh, but you can go to the Spruce, and they're, they're kind of a tongue-in-cheek uh, organization that does semi-humorous things like this. 
Someone sent me this. Uh, <laughs> you know, the Star Wars uh, fans uh, dig into a lot of detail. This is all the Star Wars characters expressed in one of the 16 personality types from Myers-Briggs. Um, again, somebody had a lot of time on their hands. Let's talk a little bit now about the anagram. I was not familiar with it. However, it has been around quite a while. Uh, it's a system that looks at, uh, defines nine types of personalities. It goes back to the 50s, uh, largely or originated in South America, Bolivia, and Chile. Had it, it had tremendous popularity when it was first uh, uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, it, I don't know how best to express it, but uh, those of us that, that uh, grew through the, the 60s, it was a very turbulent decade. Um, it, it, it did have quite a bit of popularity, especially in the 60s, but it has regained enormous popularity in the 2010s. Uh, my daughter is the one who uh, introduced me to it, and I have uh, taken it a couple of times. I've come out the same each time. And by what, how did I come out? Uh, there are nine types that are identified by an anagrams. The idealist, the caregiver, the performer, uh, the creative, the thinker, the loyalist, the adventurer, the protector, and the peacekeeper. Uh, and again, I have a link on uh, the uh, uh, note that you got, uh, hopefully uh, email uh, today, uh, where you can link and, and, and take uh, the, uh, the free test and see which of these numbers it comes up with. I'm using an organization called Crystal Nose uh, by Truity.com. Um, they're one of many licensed to conduct this exam. Um, I don't know uh, how much of the world they have actually done, uh, but they're the one that pops up first when you seek uh, the Enanogram uh, free tests. Uh, that's how I got it. Um, I come out of three, uh, a performer or achiever. Uh, I want to achieve great things and receive affirmation from others. Charismatic and adaptable, preferring to follow a plan of action. Obviously, there's a lot more detail uh, available uh, behind that. What I have done here, these people did not, this is not the anagram result that they themselves generated. This is an assessment by another organization. Uh, they would view Taylor Swift as being a category four creative. And I think that's probably an accurate assessment. They're cre she's creative, sensitive, and expressive. Uh, likes to be unique and seeks to find distinct identity. That's, that's probably Taylor Swift. No question, Bill Gates would be a thinker. Tends to be curious, independent, observant. Uh, loves to pursue knowledge and seek a deeper understanding of the world. Yeah, that's Bill Gates. Uh, Kelly Ripa, a performer. Yes, certainly. She's ambitious, adaptable, enthusiastic. Generally driven and loves to set and accomplish goals. Uh, Oprah Winfrey, same thing, a performer. Uh, Mark Cuban owns the uh, Dallas Mavericks. He's uh, one of the uh, investors on uh, the uh, popular television program. Uh, he's seen as a protector. He certainly is self-confident, powerful and assertive, absolutely. Uh, likes to get in debates and makes difficult decisions, absolutely. Uh, Zuckerberg seen as a thinker, um, and certainly he's had a lot to think about in the last year or so. So those are just some examples of notable personalities as to how they might uh, be uh, in the Enanogram uh, one to nine categories. A lot of words on a chart here. I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through it. Uh, again, it'll be in the handout, the printouts that you can get. Uh, this is tongue in cheek. This is all nine in anagram categories in the kitchen. Uh, let's just consider a type one, for example, the perfectionist. Yeah, if they were in the kitchen, they would measure everything to scale, reading and rereading the recipe over and over. Oh, yes, you can see a perfectionist in the kitchen 
they're going to stay right on the recipe. And it goes through all nine of the personality types here. Uh, this is done by, um, it's, on, it's, it's on Instagram where I found levelup.enagram. This is a little more important for you to understand. You know that online dating has certainly got a tremendous boost uh, during the pandemic. And it continues to be a major uh, uh, social media activity to meet new people. Uh, this is, uh, I picked three because I'm a three. Say you're in a relationship with a type three. How should my wife, who's been in a relationship with a type three for quite some time, how should she behave relative to my type three personality? She should have extra grace because of my competitiveness and my need to look successful. She's tried to avoid getting in the way of my forward momentum or taking too much of my time. If we get in a conflict, and heaven knows we've had our conflicts, she has to remind me that successful results can come with many different styles and that people are important and challenge my rhetoric of propaganda while allowing me to save face. She does a good job of that. And then finally, she should support me by supporting me in my having feelings about my failures, and I've had my failures, and encourage me to slow down and pay attention to my health. And she does a very good job of that. Again, this is from at level up dot an anagram. And for any of the anagram types, you can get this kind of report at no charge. So which an anagram type are you? Remember I said uh, that uh, online dating has become uh, a, a very popular use of social media? Not infrequently after what? Two, three, four, five dates where a relationship may be, may be starting to become serious. Maybe the two parties will take an in anagram and find out what type they are. Presumably, for each type, there are four other types for which compatibility exists. And here they are. In my case, a two, nine, seven, or an eight. Well, my wife is a seven. So, gosh, we didn't have the advantage of that 50 years ago. Uh, but uh, I guess we are compatible according to the anagram. But again, if you take that test, uh, you can get that kind of result uh, back if uh, you're curious. We really don't have enough time to do this one. Uh, you can do it on your own. It simply asks you um, 10 questions and you simply look A, B, or C, or A through E uh, for each. You write them down. And here's the old color questions again, you know, what colors you prefer. And you knew somewhere along the line in some personality test, it asked you about your dreaming. Um, and then you score yourself this way. You know, if you uh, wrote A down for question one, you give yourself two points. If you wrote C down, you add seven and so forth. And once you get total points, here are the definitions. I give this to you. I wish we had time to go through it and talk more de in more detail about it. I do not know who created this. I've had it in my portfolio for a long time. The reason I've had it in my portfolio is that I've taken it five or six times throughout my life. I always come out around 55 points. Other CU is exciting, highly volatile, rather impulsive personality, natural leader, quick to make decisions, not always the right ones. Uh, they see you bold and adventuresome, someone who will try anything once, someone who takes chances and enjoys adventures. You enjoy being in your company because of the excitement you radiate. I like that. I've always liked that. I've always thought, yeah, that's a pretty good description of my personality. I will tell you that of the 400, now over 600 who have participated in this program, 
more people have come back to me to say that, yeah, yeah, the, uh, as long as it's kind of in the middle of a paragraph, point wise, they like the description. They feel it really is an accurate description of who they are, more so than some of the other exercises. Uh, if you do get a chance to do this on your own and uh, care to comment, I'd be interested in knowing uh, if, you, uh, if you found it uh, fairly descriptive of your own personality. Um, there is another approach called the four temperaments. Uh, it is uh, in use today. We've created here in the United States. It basically looks at four categories of personalities, artisan, rational, guardian, or idealist. Uh, you can go to this site here if you wish to take uh, the exercise. And don't you know, uh, here are the characteristics. An artist, a guardian, idealist, rational. Of the people who have taken the four temperaments test, nearly half of the universe are considered guardians. So it doesn't really break things out into a substantial amount of detail. And don't you know, somebody has tried to place all 16 uh, Myers-Briggs types into those four buckets. Uh, there they are. And I always have left a homework assignment here. I want you to go to this site. You will now look at pictures. Some people are more visual than verbal. You'll have 25 pictures. How do you create fun in your life? Careful planning, spontaneity. How would you make the most of a morning off? Sleep in, watch television, read a book, exercise, the to-do list. There's 25, takes about 15 minutes and you'll get a, uh, a fairly detailed description of your personality when you do that exercise. I'm gonna wrap up with this. Maybe they're just three personas and you've kind of seen this before probably. There are people who make things happen. There are people who watch things happen. <laughs> and there are people who just plain don't know what's happening. Uh, at any one point in time, I think all of us are one of those. But more seriously, we do have three different personalities. The personality we think we have, the personality others think we have, and the personality we wish we had. Final chart, not related to personality, but this is food for thought. We know the Earth is approaching 8 billion in population, 8 billion. What if we consider a scale that totals 100 points on specific characteristics of the world's population? Each of these colors is a different characteristic. Here's an example. 60% of the world lived in Asia, 15% in Africa, 11 in Europe, 9% in South America, and just 5% here. In the uh, rural city, breakdown. Uh, by cities, cities include suburbs. Interestingly, it's about a 50-50 split between city, suburb, and complete countryside. Here's a surprise. Did you know that three quarters of the world's population, adults, have cell phones? Three quarters? Shocked me as a large number. But then when I stopped to think about it, a number of countries who never had landlines simply didn't, couldn't afford the infrastructure, never built it, skipped over that whole generation with landlines and, and went to cell phones. So it's kind of understanding that three quarters of the world adults have cell phones, but only 30% have internet access, 70% do not, including some parts of the US. On the religious perspective, 33% of the world are Christian, 22% percent Muslim, 14% Hindu, 7% Buddhist, 12% other religions, and there are many other religions. 12% profess no religious belief. In terms of age and longevity, two thirds of the world's population die between the age of 15 and 64. Over a quarter don't even make it that far. Many die at childbirth. Only 8% live to be 65 or older and just 7% have a college education. Putting that all together, the food for thought, 
If you have a home, you eat full meals, you have clean water, a cell phone, you can surf the net, you've gone to college. You're in a highly privileged 7% of the world's population are likely to live beyond 75. I thank you very much for your time, your attention. Uh, I'm certainly available electronically if you want to follow up with me. I will uh, get a hard copy of this out to the George uh, Mason Ali uh, representative straight away. And I uh, look to hearing from you in the future. So everyone will either get their slide through Ali at Mason or through AARP. And if you don't know, if you don't get them, send an email to those agencies. Or you can send an email directly to me. I'll uh, state it again uh, verbally. It's uh, lowercase d as in Douglas, D W Stowell, S-T-O-W-E-L-L, -L, one zero at gmail.com. D W Stowell, one zero at gmail. Com. Have a very pleasant afternoon. Uh, my next venture is a program called Future Perfect. We're going to look at technology and where it's taking us in the next eight to 10 years. Uh, are you ready for airliners with no pilots? They are being tested right now. Uh, hopefully that's not a uh, discomforting thought. I leave you with that, however, and hope to see you uh, in the not too distant future. Cheers. Okay. Thank you very much.